Hey guys, this is the first part of your Ed Excel biology. The key concept, the absolute fundamentals that you need to know and need to know really well if you're going to do well in the rest of your biology course. If you want to follow along with the video, you can get my free revision guide. You can download it from my website or you can go and get it from Amazon. Here we have our beautiful plant cell with a cell membrane. That's responsible for determining which bits go in and out of the cell. A cell wall, important for structure. The vacuole, important for structure. The cytoplasm, where most of the reactions take place. The tiny little dots are the ribosomes, which are responsible for protein synthesis. The green bits the chloroplasts. The pink ones are the mitochondria where um, energy is produced and then last but not least we have our nucleus. Here we have our animal cell with our cell membrane. Again controlling what goes in and out our mitochondria where energy is produced, ribosomes which are responsible for protein synthesis. Cytoplasm, where most of the reactions take place. And our nucleus, where is the, that's where the DNA is holding, that's the control centre of the cell. You'll notice there are several features of a plant cell that an animal cell doesn't share. For example, the cell wall, the vacuole, the chloroplasts. If you want to copy these pictures yourself, you can download them in the free version guide from my website. Here we have our bacterial cell, which has its cell membrane, controlling what goes in and out. The cytoplasm, where most of the reactions take place. The chromosome. The DNA, not in a nucleus. The flagella, which is used for um, locomotion. Ribosomes for protein synthesis. And then on the outside, we have the cell wall. Even though you have to learn the structure of a typical plant cell or a typical animal cell, there isn't really a typical type of cell because there are a wide range of differentiated specialised cells. We can see here in our cross section of the leaf, it has lots of different types of cells in. Here we have a neuron, which looks very different to a muscle cell, which is going to look very different to a skin cell or very different to a set of cells in the gut. They're going to be specialised to do their jobs. So here we have villi, which give us long surface area. Here the cells are very tall to provide structure. Here the cells have a very long body so that the neurons can travel a long distance and the muscle cells are going to stretch and contract. All cells start off looking the same. So they have your basic cell structure and then various different genes will be turned on and turned off and that's when it will start to specialise. That's when differentiation will take place and it will grow this really, really long axon or it will grow the villi or it will turn into a leaf cell. Mycoscopy techniques have varied wildly over the time. From the very, very basic starts where you had your lenses and you had to use the focus to see what was going on. These were all generally hand done, very, very basics. To ones that you're probably more familiar with in school, which have slightly more sophisticated lenses, to the massive ones that I used to work on, um, electron microscopes, where they're all controlled by computer. If you want to work out image heights, object heights or magnification from an image you've taken from a microscope, the calculation is magnification equals image height over object height. We've heard of metres, which are incredibly long. You're probably between one and two metres tall. And we can have smaller parts of metre. For example, a centimetre on my screen is about that big. And that is one times ten to the minus two metres. A millimetre is even smaller. 
that's 1 times 10 to the minus 3 metres. A micrometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 metres. A nanometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 9 metres. And a picometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 12 metres. So if our metre is going to be M, our centimetre is CM, our millimetre is MM, our micrometer is a uh, mu m, nanometer n m, and picometer p m. As you can see, measuring very very small things in meters wouldn't be a very useful way of measuring them. Amylase proteases and lipases are all enzymes and work with the Leck and Key mechanism. We have our enzyme, which has a very specifically shaped active site. So only one substrate or a couple of substrates are going to fit in there, the ones that have the complementary site. They're going to form an enzyme substrate complex and then the enzyme is either going to break apart things or it is going to join together things. It is then going to release the products and then the enzyme is unchanged and can be used again. You need to know how and temperature affects enzyme activity and it is this kind of lopsided curve. When we have really, really low temperatures, there is not enough energy. At the peak, this is the optimal temperature. And then after the peak, the enzymes get denatured which means the links between them holding everything together are being destroyed. The enzyme is not killed. I know the temptation is to say this, but the correct term is denatured. Our curve for pH is much more symmetrical. We still have an optimal pH. But when it is too high or too low, the bonds aren't going to be in place. So the active site of the enzyme is going to be broken down. So again, it is going to be denatured. There are only a certain number of active sites on an enzyme. So once they are full up, the enzyme activity can't keep increasing. So while they are filling up, the enzyme activity will increase the substrate concentration. But when they are full up, Increasing the substrate concentration won't increase the enzyme activity any further. An enzyme can be used as a catalyst for a rate of reaction. What we will see is that reaction will start to happen much faster, but it will end up at the same point. The reaction will probably end faster. This is because there are going to be other limiting factors like enzyme concentration, substrate concentration or reactant concentration. There are a number of different enzymes in the digestive system that you need to be aware of. Lipase breaks down fats into fatty acids and glycerol. It is made in the pancreas and small intestine and works in the small intestine. Protease breaks down proteins into amino acids. It is made in the stomach, pancreas, and small intestine, and works in the stomach and small intestine. Amylase breaks down starch into sugars. It is made in the salivary glands, pancreas, and small intestine. And it works in the mouth and small intestine.
You need to know how to test for fats, starch, sugars and proteins. Fats can be tested for using the emulsion test or the filter paper test. For the emulsion test you add ethanol, shake it, add water and look for a colour change. If it goes cloudy then lipids are present. With the filter paper test if you rub it on filter paper the filter paper should go see through. To test the starch you add iodine and if starch is present it is going to go dark black, dark blue colour, that means it's going to be a positive result. To test for addition of sugars we can act, add Benedict solution Heat it for two minutes um, in a water bath and if it goes red, if there's lots of sugar or kind of like a pale green yellow, if there's a little bit of sugar. We can test protein with the burette's test, so we add... We add burette solution and it will go purple if it is present. Calorimetry is testing how much the temperature of a water changes when we heat it with a known mass of a fuel. This can be done with solid fuel, so we have a known mass of a solid fuel. You probably have this on um, a metal skewer, and then you heated water and measure the temperature change, or it can be done with a liquid fuel as well. Here we have alcohol and an alcohol burner. You can then measure the temperature change and work out the energy released. The biggest source of error in this is going to be heat loss to the surroundings here, because not all of the heat is going straight up into heating the water. When we're talking about diffusion, we are talking about things moving from a high concentration down the diffusion gradient to an area of low concentration. This could be things moving from an area inside a cell where they've been made to another area, or it could be things moving out of a cell. For example, it could be um, happening in the lungs, these are the alveoli, the air spaces, and this is the capillary travelling around it. These are very, very thin, uh, walls only one cell thick, and carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from the blood into the lungs so that it can be breathed out, and oxygen is going to diffuse from the lungs into the blood so it can be taken around the body. All this can be in the gut, these are the villi of the gut, this is the gut cavity here, and you notice again they are one cell thick, and just like the alveoli, they have a very large surface area. We're going to get digested food moving from the gut cavity into the blood so that it can be taken around the rest of the body. So diffusion is the movement of gases or any particles that dissolved in solution moving down a concentration gradient from a high concentration to an area of low concentration. Osmosis is specifically the movement of water through a partially permeable membrane from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. So you notice this partially permeable membrane, the uh, pores in it aren't large enough for the um, solute to move through, so the water is going to be the one that moves through here. This sort of thing can happen in root hair cells where we're looking at the uptake of water. Active transport, again, is a movement across a membrane, but it's from, this time, a low concentration to a high concentration against the concentration gradient. So our channel, or active transport channel, is going to pick up something that it wants. It is then going to move that through the channel to the other side. This could happen, for example, when we're talking about glucose in the gut or minerals in roots. Ouch!
This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.